know where missions begins, right? Where does missions begin? Home, at home. And uh, so we have some folks that have been working a military ministry here at home, trying to build it and, and working hard to do it, bringing in some folks. And so tonight, especially uh, since military men, Trey, has uh, come back from the military, uh, we're going to give them the service tonight and uh, let them talk about their ministry. Uh, and Brother uh, Stills is in charge of this. Brother Travis one and Brother Travis two. Uh, we'll be in this night, so. Thanks, Pastor. Appreciate it. First, I'd like to really thank Smyrna Baptist Church and Pastor Adams, especially for just allowing us to um, do what the Lord has called us to do in reaching the military in the Pensacola area. There's a lot more military here than what I really expected, even um, a lot of retirees. Um, but there's, there's a lot of active duty military in this area. I wasn't expecting <clears throat> quite so many, but there's, there's a lot. And so um, I just want to thank you, Pastor, for allowing us to, to try to be able to reach them, you know, using uh, having a ministry in this church to reach them and having just a heart for them um, because they're, they're very needy. Military are very needy. Um, and a lot of times being away from home, they, um, they get out and they get into a lot of uh, trouble via alcohol and other immoral uh, acts. And um, what they really need is the Lord. And so um, I'm thankful that we are part of a, part of a church that uh, has a heart need or has a heart to try to reach them. Um, recently, about, I would guess about two or three months ago, maybe a little bit longer, I took a, a training um, down on Naval Air Station in Pensacola. And um, I worked there as a civilian, if you, did, if you didn't know. I worked for an AFAC, or it's called Navy Facilities. And um, I took this training, and it was on suicide awareness and prevention is what it was. And I had, they gave us a staggering um, statistic, and that is there have been more military that took their own life, died by suicide, in the last 20 years or so than were lost in all the war on terror. So our military, you know, they have a problem right now. They have a spiritual problem. And we know what the answer is. The answer is a relationship with God through the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, pornography is not going to solve it. Uh, alcohol is not going to solve it. Uh, there's, no, there's no solution. And um, a lot of times what they're told to do to deal with the problem is just to, just to be a man or just to be strong and get through it and push through. And that's not going to cure it. They need to have, um, they need the Lord to have a spiritual issue. And so um, I'm thankful that we can be here, we can be a part of this church and trying to reach them and trying to uh, uh, see them saved. We want to disciple them. And uh, we need your prayers. And I'm going to turn, turn over here in just a second to Trey. But we need your prayers to, as we try to grow this ministry. We definitely uh, we have a presence on the base, but we want to get them here in, in this church. We want to get them uh as a part of this church and get them uh, saved. We want to get them uh, discipled. And, and, then, and then when they go to the next duty station, they can be a part of, a, of another local church. There's a lot of different churches all around the world that are dedicated to, to teaching and training military. And they can really grow in their relationship with the Lord and really be a difference among their uh, the people they serve with. So Trey would come up and uh, share for a minute. Trey just graduated boot camp on, on Friday. Um, really proud of him. You know, he's, uh, it's not easy to go through any boot camp, even Coast Guard. I kind of get <laughs> a little bit. But uh, I, I, think he, uh, I think he's done well. And um, so if you just want to share what the Lord's laid on your heart. Uh, first of all, I just want to thank the church. I did go into the Coast Guard boot camp expecting it to be easy, maybe like the Air Force. Um, <laughs> I went into it expecting it to be easy, but it was the complete opposite. Spiritually and physically, it was the hardest thing I've ever done. Uh, I felt all the praise, though, and I really appreciate that. I felt the Lord. I would never felt alone. There were a bunch of other recruits that were always talking about how they felt alone and how they 
just they just miss alcohol, and it's really a big problem with alcohol because they I spent you know, eight weeks in close quarters with 40 other people and heard more talk about alcohol in eight weeks than I have my whole life. All they could talk about was when they could get out and go get drunk, and it's a real problem in the military, and I, I really appreciate all that Brother Travis and Brother Travis have done to uh, help the ministry here, and I just want to say thank you very much to the church and that y'all are amazing, and I always feel loved, and I appreciate it. Thank you. So I'm going to let uh, Gunny Dobbins speak next. Brother Brother Travis here is going to come up and share his testimony and just what the Lord has done in his life. And um, I hope you'll you'll see. You know, um, Jesus Christ makes a difference. You know, He really does. And um, I told Pastor before I started, I'm not a very eloquent speaker. I, I wouldn't say that I've been given that gift. Um, but what I have with the Lord is real. I have a real relationship with God. And I think that's what not only the military is looking for, but the world. Um, they're looking for something that's real. And the things that they're trying to find it is not going to satisfy. It might satisfy, it might keep you happy for a little while, but there's no lasting satisfaction in anything apart from a relationship with God. So, Brother Travis, you want to come? Hey, good evening, family. Uh, so, I can speak personally from not growing up in a Christian home to getting saved as a teenager to entering the service and how dark it is and how easy it is to get away from God. Uh, that happened to me personally. I spent eight years of my career separated from God in just a, a dark hole that the military is. Uh, and I was stuck uh, in my rank where I was at in the, my career. And it was just, you could, I couldn't see past exactly where I was until uh, I got right with God. Uh, and it was my son actually dealing with some stuff with him. I knew where I needed to get him to correct some behavioral things that were going on. Uh, but that drew my wife and I back into church. Um, and when we got back into church, it was almost like when I got here. It was just the one step in the door, and then it was like, okay, this is where I'm supposed to be, so I'm just going to go. Right? And then we were, it was a Sunday morning thing, and then two weeks later it was Sunday school and Sunday morning, and then it was all three services, and then every time the doors were open, we were there. Uh, but it was just like that. God flipped the switch in my life. I had promotions, billets, awards, everything was just poured out, and I, all I did, all I could do was give the glory to God. And I think, I believe that that is why I am here today, and I'll tell you how I got to Pensacola, uh, and it's only by God's grace that I'm here. I was at a training command, and they kept telling me I needed to go deploy, I need to go deploy, I need to go deploy, because uh, I'd been there for quite a while. Well, then I got orders to a unit that was going to go do a, a pretty rudimentary deployment to Okinawa, uh, pretty basic stuff. But in the midst of doing that, I got recruited to go to HMX-1, which is a helicopter presidential squadron, which every, which means everywhere the president goes, we go with them with the helicopters. So talk about an upbeat tempo and having to go and do things often, right? They're gone every couple of months, drop them a dime, hey, president's got to go over here, you're going, right? And you're talking anywhere in the world at that point. Um, kind of some internal stress started to set in, like, oh, man. You know, it's a pretty prestigious place to go, but it's like, oh, I'm like, I don't, I don't know, I don't have a warm and fuzzy about this, right? So just prayer, supplication, time in the Bible, time with God, and I get a call. Hey, uh, you're the short man on the list. We got too many people here. You're gonna go somewhere else. Where do you want to go? I, I don't know. Where do you got? How does Pensacola sound? Phenomenal. Always heard great things about Pensacola. I'm coming to the end of my career anyway. I was like, what better place to go than, you know, the destination spot. Uh, little did I know I was going to get in here and find my family. Uh, so I appreciate all that you do here. 
for not only me, but my, my wife, my son, and just to, to walk in and feel a warm embrace is, it, some of you just may not know uh, how lucky this, or how blessed this place really is uh, to, to come in and just feel at home. Uh, it's, it is a phenomenal thing, and I'm here by way of the Marine Corps uh, through, God, through God's grace. I know this is not like a charge for you, right? But I will say, stay in touch with mom, right? And the priority one, every time you get orders, wherever you go, is it, find a place for you to, to go and, and get with God. Because if you stay there, he'll take care of everything else for you. That's all I got. back now I want to just share a little bit about my testimony and then I got a few more verses that the Lord's just kind of laid on my heart tonight. If you want to turn to 2 Chronicles chapter number 7 we'll look at verse number 12. A lot of people are very familiar with 2 Chronicles 7 14. This is my testimony um, and something that the Lord how the Lord spoke to me through this verse uh, several years ago. So, a little bit of my background. I grew up in a home that went to church three times a week. Um, vacation Bible school, things of that nature, anything that the church had going on, I uh, was drugged to church, you know, so to speak. Um, My mom uh, was very involved with church. She she helped serve. She helped uh, you know with the kids and nursery things of that nature. My dad. It was several years before he actually came to know the Lord, and um, he. Uh, I would say he never really grew as he should. There's a danger of that, by the way, if you look in, I think it's uh, Second Peter. Talks about growing and adding to your faith, virtue, and these are just different things. Because if you don't, you're going to get to a place where you're not even going to think you're saved anymore. So it's very important to not want you saved to grow and to try to please God and to try to build your relationship with Him. It really, it comes down to, you know, giving him that time each day, just like Travis talked about. Reading his word, praying, it's very simple. You know, in any relationship, a relationship's built on trust. It's built on time spent together. You know, we talk to God through prayer. God talks to us through his word. And obviously services and godly music and things of that nature. But you have to build your relationship with God. Needless to say, my dad never really grew, so when I was around 13 years old, my parents got divorced. Now, I had gone forward in the service when I was 11. Uh, there was a preacher named Mays Jackson. A lot of people probably know him. Very famous evangelist back in the day. He preached a sermon called, When God Gives You Up. You ever heard that sermon? That sermon would scare the daylights out of you. It would scare you to the altar very quickly. And so, um, I remember that service very well, but between 11 and 13, I don't think I really matured in Christ as I should. And so when my parents divorced, what that meant for me was that I was on my own. My mom worked two jobs. My mom went to college, so if I wanted to go to school, I went to school. If I didn't want to go to school, I didn't go. And so I missed a lot of school. I started hanging out with bad friends. And uh, was very fortunate to even graduate high school. The only reason I graduated is because I wanted to go into the Marine Corps. And so um, I graduated and, and went to the Marine Corps and started down that path. And I started seeing a lot of things, uh, drinking, uh, things going on. And uh, I got selected for something called uh, Yankee White Program. 
which is a program where you uh, you go through the security background check, and then eventually you either wind up one of two places. You wind up at Camp David, or you wind up at a place called the White House Communications Agency in Washington, D.C. And I am not a city boy, so I said, I want to go to Camp David, which is in Maryland. So I went there, and I guarded the president for two years. While I was there, after going through this extensive background check and meeting with a psychiatrist and all these things, I saw a guy take his life. He took, his, he took a belt. He, you can imagine, you can use your imagination, and he, and he hung himself. And, and we were all shocked because this was supposed to be, you know, this place where people were very, uh, there was no mental illness. People had, you know, a, a healthy, uh, they were healthy mentally, they were healthy physically. And like I said, a lot of times in the military, though, they they have their version of religion. They really do. Um, but it's not really doctrinally sound, I would say, in accordance with what the Bible teaches. So I went on. I finished up my uh, Marine Corps career. I got went back to the infantry, went to Okinawa for six months, and got out. And I made the decision I was going to go to college when I got out. So I went to college, got my engineering degree. Took my first job in Atlanta, Georgia, and met my beautiful bride. And shortly after, we moved to Jacksonville, Florida. One of the things I've learned uh, just from living life is that too much change right away, too many things that change, brings a lot of stress. But a new job, I had. Um, A new home, a new wife, and a baby on the way. And I was getting back into church at that time. I'd been going back to church for a couple of years at that point. And so I started really struggling with depression and suicidal thoughts. And what I really struggled with was knowing for sure I was saved. Because I was had started reading the Bible at that time, and as I would read through the Gospels, I noticed that when Jesus touched the blind man, the blind man could see. When he told when he told the guy that was deaf, you know, when he healed him, he was different. There was something different in their lives, and I could not see that evidence of salvation back from when I was eleven years old. Of course, you know, the gospel show all these things to show that Jesus has, he has ultimate power. He can do whatever he wants. But a lot of times those <clears throat> pictures of these people being healed and raised from the dead are also spiritual pictures of salvation. These people were saved and, and you know, people, their lives were changed. So I didn't see that in my life and I really began to struggle. And so... Um, this went on. Sometimes I was high, sometimes I was low, and um, I um, would have trouble sleeping at night. I would think, the rapture's going to happen, and I'm going to be left, and I can't be saved. I felt like God had, I was a reprobate at that point. I didn't think that God would save me or that he even wanted to. And so I was counseling with pastors and all this stuff, and this, this went on sometimes, this went on for years. And eventually we moved back to um, Tennessee, but I just really struggled. And I don't really know if I can really explain to you how much pain I was going through mentally and spiritually during that time. It's hard to really talk, of really, it's really expressing words. But one night, Stacy had gone to um, sleep with the girls one of them was sick or something and I just began to pour out my heart to God and um, I would say you know my faith was very small I didn't even think God really wanted to save me at that point but I knew I wanted to be saved I was laying in my bed and I poured out my heart and I begged God to save me and change my life and as I said a few minutes ago, I was reading my Bible every day at that point. So the next day I got up 
And my scheduled devotional time was 2 Chronicles chapter number 7. And I read verse number 12. Now the context is, at that point, right before I went to sleep that night, I thought to myself, did God really hear me? Did God really hear me? And when I woke up the next day, that was the first thought I had. I wonder if God really heard me last night. This is what that verse says. And the Lord appeared to Solomon by night and said unto him, I have heard thy prayer. Oh, wow. Who put that right there? I wondered if somebody was videotaping me and going to, there was a joke or something that was getting ready to happen. But I knew that God was talking to me from his word. And so I continued to read my Bible over the next year or so. And if you want to flip now to 1 Kings chapter number 9. And sometimes I would think, ah, you know, I know I'm saved. I know that God was speaking to me right there. I knew, I knew that he had, had spoken to me. But, you know, we have an enemy and it's not China. We have an enemy and his name is the devil. And I love what we, what we just sang a few minutes ago, that the tempter is going to be banished. I was like, hallelujah, amen, one day the tempter is going to be banished. Uh, and he, but the devil did not want me to get this settled in my life. He did not want to get this uh, matter of salvation settled in my life. And so um, he told me, hey, you know, you, you, you. You prayed, but you really didn't go forward in church. You didn't make a profession of faith. You didn't go forward in public. So there's no way that God really saved you. And so I went to my pastor and I said, hey, you know, I've been struggling with this for, for a while. And uh, this is what happened to me. What do you think? And he said, I would go forward in church. This was on a Saturday. He said, I would go forward in church. I would make a profession of faith. And then I would, I would put it behind me. So the next day, I went forward to church, and I missed my devotional that morning because I overslept or something. I overslept that day, and I got home that afternoon, and my scheduled devotional reading at that time was 1 Kings chapter 9. I didn't even know at that time there's such a thing as called parallel passages. But this verse almost says exactly the same thing that 2 Chronicles 7, 12 says. And it says, And the Lord said unto him, I have heard thy prayer and thy supplication that thou hast made before me. And Brother Jamie's, Brother Jamie told me something recently. He said, The Lord doubled it up for you just like he did for uh, Joseph in Genesis. And I was like, Hallelujah. I never thought of it that way. That was a blessing, Brother Jamie. The Lord spoke to me twice. And told me that he heard my prayer when I called on him for salvation. And that meant so much, so much to me. And it gave me what I needed was assurance of my salvation. That I had a relationship with him. And that I could never perish. The Bible says you never perish. And from that point on I, I began to serve the Lord. And live for the Lord. And when I said that I got up here tonight and I'm not a very eloquent speaker. Let me, go, let me give you a little more context of that. In my church back in Tennessee, on Wednesday night, they would call on people to come up front and pray. And what I would do was we had a balcony that you could sit up in. And I would go up there and hide so I wouldn't get called up on. <laughs> because I hate public speaking. As I said a few weeks ago, I hate public speaking. But I will tell you this, I love the Lord and I want to bring Him glory. And so that, this is my testimony of how I got, the, you know, I got Christ, I got saved, I got it settled. And I will tell you, you, you can believe what the Bible says. It really is true. It really is true. It's real. It's not something that's make-believe. It, it really is true. And I believe that God will manifest himself to anybody that really wants to know him. If they were genuinely want to know whether the Bible is true, and they want to have a relationship with him. I believe he will save them and show them and prove himself that this is real. This is true. 
And I want to share you the second part of, of what the Lord has laid in my heart tonight. And it's found in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 57. I'll give you a second to turn there. It's a great chapter in the Bible. It's got the gospel. It, it, it states clearly what, what the gospel is. It has the rapture. It has, um, it's got so much. It's, it's jam-packed. It's got service. It's got encouragement. This is a great chapter in the Bible. Um, 1 Corinthians 15, 57 says, But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. That's football season. I was thinking about this verse, about how we have victory no matter what happens in this world. We, we have victory no, no matter what happens in this world, the, the, the one that really counts, if we've trusted Christ as Savior. And this world... If uh, me and Pastor were talking a little bit before service, this world thinks it's going to win. This world thinks that all it, that all there is to life is to get as much as you can, you know, do whatever you want, and then that's it. But we have um, we have a hope. We have a real hope that's found in the Lord Jesus Christ. And I was thinking about uh, some of these verses today about some of the things that we have. In Christ, some of the things that we are blessed to have. The Bible says, Second Peter, I'm sorry, First Peter 1 4, we have an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you. I actually spoke, I kind of taught this verse. Well, as I said, I don't really, I wouldn't consider my, consider what I do preaching. I just, I just try to share God's word. Um, Brother Shannon was there, but I talked about the greatest comeback of all time because, you know, when Jesus was crucified, his disciples went in hiding. You think about this, all these, these uh, Pharisees and his enemies, they thought they had triumphed. <laughs> they hadn't triumphed. They had just done exactly what God use them to do. God never was not in control. Jesus said in John, I lay my life down and I gladly take it up again. He was always in control. They thought they were in control. They thought they had successfully eliminated him. That did not happen. He rose from the grave victorious. Just like he said he was going to do, he did it. Now this verse is 1 Corinthians 15, 57 it talks about the victory over death. Death, as we've been studying, the wages of sin is death. That word death also means separation a lot of times when it's used in the context. We don't have to worry about ever being separated from God when we trust Christ as Savior. We have that victory. I'll tell you another something else that Jesus Christ has given us the victory over it. You can look at Revelation chapter 1. I was thinking about this verse. It says, I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore, amen, and have the keys of hell and of death. We don't have to worry about the consequences of past sin or future sin. I don't have to worry about, I'm going to, I'm going to, I don't want to, I don't want to sin, but I have Christ in my life that is going to give me the victory. He's going to give me also, I don't have to worry about the, the punishment for sin. Because Christ already took that punishment on the cross. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 6. If you want to flip over there for just a second. It says, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved. One of the things I told my our, our Sunday school class this morning is that when Jesus Christ was dying on the cross, he was separated from not only um, 
his followers. I mean, these, these were men that he had, and people that he had invested his life. His beard ripped out. And then he had the shame of being spit on and mocked. I think a lot of times people don't think about the emotional pain that he must have have endured by having somebody that he loved so much say, I don't even know that man. Turn his back on him. Say, I don't even know him. And then none of his followers were there. They all, they all ran away and hid. And that's exactly what hell is going to be like. People think, oh yeah, it's going to be just about a physical pain. No, it's going to be an emotional pain. It's going to be a broken heartedness that you're never going to... It's going to be an isolation type pain where you're going to endure that for all of eternity. And I'm thankful that I don't have to worry about that. Look at uh, John 16, verse 33. It says, These things have I spoken unto you, that in me ye might have peace. In the world you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I've overcome the world. We're all going to have difficulties, we're all going to have tribulation. That's the saved, and that's the unsaved. The difference is we can have peace. <laughs> we can have peace. We can have peace. We can have God helping us. We can have, we can have God answer our prayers. I was thinking about just difficulties and how, you know, a lot of times we, what I usually do is I just complain, sit and pray. You know, I, I really, uh, I go through difficult times, and, and the first thing I, do, I should do is, is pray. And um, because it's an opportunity, it's an opportunity for God to be glorified, for God to answer prayer. And a lot of times I miss it so many times. But I think God allows difficulties in our life just for that very case. I think he allows difficulties. That's one of the reasons. Just so we'll draw nigh to him. I got one more verse for you and then I'll ask pastor to come. I will ask you this. I will challenge you on this after this verse. Are you a winner or a loser? Have you accepted Christ as your Savior? Have you really accepted Him? Or you played church? That would be my question. I wanted something that was real. And I found it in Christ. I found He was everything I needed. Everything I needed. And if you're on the winning side, are you living a life that's drawing others to Him? It's a great verse. 2 Corinthians 8 verse 9 says, For ye know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes, your sakes he became poor, that ye through his poverty might be rich. Amen. You know what that verse means? That means that he laid aside everything and he owns it all. He laid it all aside for you. He laid aside everything for you. What have you laid aside for him? What have you given up for him? He's done so much for me, and um, I need to do more for him. Um, I'm going to pray, and I'm going to let Pastor come and kind of close this out. Lord, I thank you so much for your goodness and your grace. I thank you that you saved me years ago, Lord. I don't even deserve to be saved, but you saved me, Lord. And you allowed me to serve you, Lord. What a privilege I had. What a privilege we all have. May you help us, Lord. May you help us to draw nigh to you. May you help us to be the people you want us to be. And I pray these things in your name. In Jesus' name, amen.